It's a great pleasure to, to, to welcome Professor Tansid Ford uh, to present our Waterloo Foundation public lecture, which is part of our Future Minds programme, funded by uh, the Waterloo Foundation, which we're, we're extremely grateful for. Um, the title of the, of the, of the programme actually refers to, to the early career researchers and the people who are here earlier will have heard some of this, the, the early, early career and other people. people. Um, and really it refers to, to our, our studies in child development and in neuroscience and psychology. But of course, it couldn't be any more relevant in the changing world that we find ourselves in today. And obviously the subject of the, of the lecture, of the public lecture today. So Tamsin is Professor of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge, where she is the head of Department of Psychiatry, having moved from Exeter University uh, Medical School in 2019, so not that long ago, although it seems like a, a lifetime ago now, to all. So she's an internationally renowned uh, child psychiatric epidemiologist. His research spans from the academic to the direct improvement of policy and practice of services and interventions for children and young people's mental health. Uh, amongst the many awards she's, she's, she's received for rec that recognise her contribution, she's been awarded a CBE for her work in transforming mental health services and schools in the UK. As I said at the beginning, uh, Tamsin is head of department. Um, and in fact, if you want to know, it's like being a senior academic under these conditions. I noticed that she's written a brilliant blog, actually, to mark uh, Health Awareness Week on, on her department's webpage. It's really, really good to read. OK, so you've heard enough about me, from me, sorry. Uh, and I now invite Tamsin to give her presentation. So thank you. But I'm here to talk to you about the mental health of children and young people in relation to COVID. So um, we need to start um, from the, the background of, um, of this. I'm just going to double check my slides because I have a horrible feeling um, you, oh. that they, these might not be the correct. No, they look all right. Sorry, I'm just slightly panicking. I can't tell you how many presentations I've done on this. This is the second one this this week. Um, and those of you who've seen me in different places will know that that particular slide I update, which is why I know it's the right one. Um, anyway, so we have to start from if we're going to think about how COVID impacted on us, we need to think about where we were before COVID started. And um, this paper, which was led by colleagues um, from UCL, but um, I was part of, is really interesting. So there have actually been mutterings in the press about poor children's mental health and a crisis in mental health of our children and young people for probably five or six years. Um, and so what this group did was they took panel surveys. So these were separate surveys of different people every year or couple of years from England, also from Wales and also from Scotland over a 20 year per, uh, period and um, assess whether or not mental health had changed. And really interestingly, on the questionnaires that were used, um, they varied slightly, but the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which you'll hear quite a lot about in this talk, was a very common one, but there were also measures of, of anxiety and depression. There wasn't a consistent signal that um, mental health was deteriorating, but what was very consistent and showed a trend right the way across two decades was that parents and young people were more likely to admit on a survey that they were worried about mental health. And that to me is a good thing because it means our stigma campaigns or anti-stigma campaigns are working. And if we can get more children to the effective treatments we have, as well as improving the treatments we have, actually people being more willing to say, yes, I think there's a problem is a good thing. When you come to the pandemic, the other important thing to think about is, firstly, we have a data gap in relation to children. And secondly, there is an enormous signal to noise ratio out there. So this reference, this link, and I will make my slides available as a PDF for anyone who wants them so you can go and have a look at it. This is an incredible piece of work that's being done by a team in McGill University in Canada 
they have been running now for a year a living systematic review of the literature in relation to mental health and children and young people. They've got three related questions. One which is most pertinent to this lecture is how has mental health changed with the arrival of the pandemic and during the pandemic? They actually stopped the second review, um, which was about what factors predicted change because the quality of the literature they were reviewing was so poor. And actually, um, they just felt they couldn't do it with everything else. And the other questions, which were, you know, how is the pandemic affecting mental health in a defined population using repeated measures and intervention studies were more important. And as you will see, they have um, screened almost 50,000 abstracts. And um, under the bottom right hand side of the slide, I've got the numbers of these 50,000 abstracts that actually were good enough to be in, in the papers. And you'll see that there are very, very few. There is a lot of absolute rubbish out there. And that's really important because if you put, if you collect data badly, doesn't matter how big the sample is, it doesn't get rid of bias and you're likely to get very misleading results. The other thing to note in brackets and in red is just how few studies relate to children. None of these um, studies were of um, children and young people in the UK and um, they all indi indicated either an increase in anxiety symptoms or depression or both. So there are hints from these studies that there, are, there have been impacts on children and young people. So I'm primarily going to base my um, talk on our own national surveys. These were commissioned by um, the English government, but with buy-in for the first two from Wales and Scotland. And we should be really proud of them. Now, the, the question, so the, the government asked us on each occasion, and their three surveys were 1999, 2004, and then 2017. And we were asked to tell the government how many children out there have impairing mental health conditions in the population that warrant clinical intervention. As I've said, how you do this matters. So the sample frame was very clear. These are some of the largest surveys that have been done of children's mental health in the world. And they're particularly important because they were single phase. And that means every single child in the sample had a full mental health assessment. And I'm gonna talk more about what that was in the, um, later, but actually many, because that's quite an expensive and difficult thing to do, Many surveys use a very brief questionnaire screen and then they will go and get more detailed data from those who look on the screen like they're not doing so well. And then if they're a rigorous study, they'll also get a sample of those who screen negative because no screen is 100%. But that is a less accurate way of doing things. The sampling frame was chosen so that only children and siblings had an equal chance of being in the survey. Um, it was the child benefit register for the first two, but then by 2017, that was no longer universal. So we used GP records. Um, stage one, it was a, a complex survey carefully constructed to um, recreate as far as we possibly could a representative sample of the population that we were studying. So we started by what are called primary sampling units. And these were postal codes that were selected with an inverse probability of their size so that everybody in the country had an equal chance of being selected. And then within these areas that were selected, we then sampled children according to the age and socioeconomic structure of the area. These methods matter. It takes a lot of time, it costs a lot of money, but it's worth the effort because what you get back, you can trust. Whereas, you know, I'm sure we've all been bombarded with questionnaires about this or that on social media. And, you know, some of the better ones I fill in because I, I think they're interesting. And when we don't have data, actually, you know, the, the social media questionnaires are quicker and faster and can get out into the field. But, you don't know who, who has responded. Even if you wait back to the population 
you don't know who has seen this, the link and not responded and you won't get it completely right. And just because it's large does not make sure that you get rid of bias. So for example, I've seen a study with 65,000 people in it from China, despite the heavily male gendered skew to the population because of the single child policy, it had 65% women in it. So it probably tells you quite a lot about how women are reacting, but not very much about men. And th there are groups that just don't have digital access or don't respond to these surveys that you have to work very hard to make sure they're included. Obviously, um, if you are dealing with two-year-olds, you need their parents' help to collect data. And in fact, there is sound evidence that if you um, collect data from more than one informant about a child, you will get a more accurate assessment. I am surprised to need to repeat that even sometimes in clinical circles where people have kind of retrenched back into clinics because they feel too busy and some managers are saying, no, 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 you haven't got time to go to schools, you haven't got time to speak to teachers. I very firmly believe you cannot assess a child properly unless you have, um, and I, I have direct experience of that kind of managerial comment, which I think is very unhelpful and actually doesn't save you time. So in these national surveys, for those under 16, parents were always interviewed. For young people, clinically, I, however young they were, I would try and interact with them my, myself. But for research under the age of 11, it's quite hard to get very reliable data back. Um, and therefore, in the surveys, we started at age 11. And then once the youngsters are 17, they are the primary informant. And so bringing in a parent or a teacher for any of them relates to the primary informant's consent. Now, how you collect data matters. So if you're asking lots of people the same questions, of course, they don't always agree. And that as a clinician, that's interesting. And in clinics, you make sophisticated judgments about whose account you believe. It becomes a bit of a headache in research. Um, and quite difficult to resolve. So some studies have kind of set rules that, oh, I'll only accept a problem as there is if everybody says it's there. And others have said, oh, no, 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 if anybody says it's there, because people, you know, might be reticent um, or might want to give a socially desirable response. So I'll, I'll accept it if anybody reports it. Now, you can see the problem if you're trying to count cases in the population of such an approach, and it's just not what we do in the clinic. There are also a couple of extremes in terms of how to get data. So you can have a very, very structured interview. And it's great because it can be administered by lay people. You don't need an expensive clinician. In fact, lay people are better than clinicians because they don't go off on tangents according to their experience. They just go through the, the structured questionnaire and it gives very, very reliable answers. And by that, I mean, you will get the same answer back whoever, you know, however many times you do it, more or less. The trouble is you can't pick up when someone's misunderstood you. So, you, you know, you might not get a good answer. It might be the same answer repeatedly, but it might not be right. And so what the measure that we use in these surveys does is it uses very structured questions that just relate to our diagnostic criteria. But where there's a problem, the informants are, are asked to describe it in a more qualitative semi-structured way. And there are semi-structured assessments you can use. The trouble is you need lots of training to do them and they're less reliable. They're more valid, but they're less reliable. So this instrument is clever because it does both. So lay interviewers went out into the home and interviewed people. The teachers, if the parents consented, were provided a questionnaire. And then a small team of clinical raters put all the information together the way they would in a clinic because we were trying to answer the government how many children out there need um, some, some help with their mental health. And these are the kind of problems that we were, um, were measuring. So emotional um, mental health conditions are depression and various subtypes of anxiety. Um, then there are behavioral problems that are impairing the child's ability to access um, school or leisure or restricting the family and getting in the way of their development. ADHD, 
um, and a collection of less common um, disorders that are, are bunched together. So bottom line, between um, the, the last 20 years where you've got these three surveys, there has there had been a deterioration in children's mental health at school age. The, the age range of five to 15 is slightly odd, but it was because the adult, adult survey included 16 year olds and the government wouldn't pay for it twice. And that because that's what we've got at baseline, that's what we've had to measure when we're doing comparisons. It wasn't a big increase. It was in fact smaller than many people thought it would be because of the demands on services, but it was significant and it was there in both boys and girls. It was almost entirely explained by an increase in emotional disorders. And actually that increase was much more marked in the older teenagers on whom we had data for the first time and had been seen as early as 2014 in the adult surveys amongst 16 to 24 year olds. And the signal is so strong and has come from so many different um, surveys, including the Millennium cohort, that actually the government now regards young women as, as a high risk vulnerable group that we need to keep an eye on and, and think about how we support. And it's important to say when you're reporting these population averages, it masks your um, population, the, the variation within the population. So a little bit after the 1999 survey in, in 2002 and 2003, there was a series of surveys using the census for children who were looked after, again, in England, Wales, and Scotland. And these data put those three surveys together and compare them with the 99 survey of children living in private households, split into two groups, the most deprived living in a household where nobody was working and everyone and the family was in the receipt of benefits, compared to the rest of the 99 sample. And what you can see is for every type of mental health condition you can have, the prevalence was much higher in the vulnerable groups as were the risk factors that we had available across all the samples. But being a child who was looked after was an independent predictor of having poor mental health. The other thing I should say is when we went back, you'll notice on that first diagram I put up of all the, the surveys that the first two had a three year follow up where the whole survey was redone again. Um, about half the children who met diagnostic criteria at baseline, when you put them together and you follow forwards for three years, about half of them met diagnostic criteria three years later. Now I've called it persistence with quotes around it because of course we've got two snapshots and we know very little about what went on in between. But it is an indication that these actually are not transient problems at this level of severity. And that's really important in the context of um, COVID as well with this um, excellent paper from um, your own group in Cardiff, which demonstrates that actually the outcomes for children born this millennium who have poor mental health in childhood is worse than it was for previous cohorts. So they compared the millennium cohort um, group in childhood with the Alsbach cohort who were born in the 1990s and then the 1970 birth cohort. And that should worry us. I think it's also in the context of COVID, um, good to have a think about what predicted the persistence of um, disorder in the national survey samples. So peer relationships, and these have been really profoundly disrupted for, for many children, particularly, I think, the younger primary school children for whom, you know, the, the option to be in a WhatsApp chat or, um, you know, other types of social media and, and keep your social contacts going that way hasn't been there. Um, and the other constellation is how parents are affected. So where parents are either struggling with their own mental health or finding it very difficult to cope that predicts childhood mental health conditions persisting. The final sort of setup point I want to make 
um, is that for every one or two that reach diagnostic criteria, there are probably three or four others who are struggling. So what you are seeing here is scores on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire from 2004, according to young people over here, to parents and to teachers. And it's fascinating how different these graphs are um, because they're all asked exactly the same questions. Um, but the, the, the point for putting them up is the blue arrows is where the clinical cut point is and you don't have a distinct group. What makes the difference between whether people meet diagnostic criteria or not, or they're seriously impaired, is their psychological, social and sort of biological um, predispositions and supports. And those are our levers to support children to cope with what we've all been through and to move forward. So now on to the topic that you all came to hear about, which is how are children and young people and families faring um, during COVID? So these um, brief summaries are from a really excellent study by Kathy Cresswell and her team at Oxford. It is a convenient sample, but they worked really hard to try and reach um, harder to reach groups and they've done quite a good job at retaining those who did sign up so in terms of telling us about change over time um, and they have a paper in print at the moment um, you know it is a good study I put it up here to highlight how difficult and I'm sure many of you know um, from your own bitter experience if you're trying to parent and work it is not easy and that is taking its toll on everybody's mental health and well-being. Um, the next thing to highlight is that children were more worried about their friends and families than they were about themselves. Um, and then there have been fluctuations in, in children's mental health, which I'll, I'll pick up later. Another really good cross-sectional survey, it's actually part of a series of surveys that have been carried out every year, another team in Oxford, um, called the Oxwell survey. This had a defined sample frame, which was um, 237 schools across six counties in the southeast of England. Um, they were all recruited via, via these schools, um, and these data were gathered towards the end of the summer term last year. And I put up this particular slide to show that although as you get older, students report more of an impact on, on mental health from lockdown. Actually, it's not uniform. And there's quite a chunk of young people who are saying that their life got better. These were the worries that students um, reported. And doing well in school and college is something that's very much reported repeatedly across surveys about child well-being, And I think we need to really think carefully about the level of academic pressure that we're putting on our young people. Because, you know, compared with well-being in other countries, we don't fare well. And while some might argue that, you know, academic results are more important, I personally disagree, but actually our academic results aren't brilliant either. So we're losing on both counts. So on to some stronger data, because not only do we have a sample frame in this one, but we have pre the onset of COVID and post the onset of COVID. This is from a team in Bristol. Bristol. The lead author is Emily Widnell. So she had gone to um, schools around the Bristol area, um, just one year group, but a thousand students in October of last year. And she hadn't intended to go back in April and May, but it just seemed like the logical thing to do because we have such a data gap for children and young people. So again, as you can see along the bottom of this slide, young people are more worried about their friends and family catching COVID or how they were coping than they were about um, their own conditions. And then for mental health, it was really interesting. So they measured with a, a particular score um, a particular scale, anxiety, depression, and well-being. And across the whole population in this age group of, of 13 and 14 year olds, there was no change. But if you split the scales by their um, established clinical cut points into those who were struggling before the pandemic, and you're looking at the one for depression, 
So before the pandemic is in blue and during lockdown is in red and a high score is bad. And what you can see is those who were struggling in October last year were doing better in April. There is a small change in those who were doing fine in October, but it's not significant. However, the one for um, the children who were struggling is, and it was across all three measures. So that's really interesting. We need to be aware that, um, you know, in terms of mental health, as well as physical health and economic fallout and education, this pandemic has not affected all groups equally. So another um, study where somebody sees the, the advantage of a sample they already had. So this is a small sample of children who are coping fine. They were con control group in a, in a school-based study in um, Cambridge. Um, relatively affluent, sort of late primary school, both before and, and during lockdown. The data was collected in about May. Interesting, there was no significant difference in anxiety measured by a scale called the ARCADS or the Revised Child and Anxiety, Child Anxiety and Depression Scale, which has about 40 questions on anxiety. Um, sorry, uh, 41 questions in all, but the vast majority are on anxiety with, with four subscales and one subscale for depression. It doesn't surprise me that the SDQ subscale for emotional disorders, which is only five items, again, four of them for, for anxiety, um, it doesn't surprise me that that subscale showed no difference in anxiety. It does surprise me that the ARCADs didn't, particularly when there was a significant increase in depression. And I put this slide up because although it's a small sample, just for clinicians to be aware that actually there might be some very young children suffering um, symptoms of depression, as suggested by this study, which is unusual. It's very rare in that, that age of children. It, it starts to become more common in the early to mid teens. A similar study where they um, gathered 12 samples, 10 in the USA, um, of data where there was pre-pandemic data and they went back and collected data at various stages last year. Now, some of the data pre-pandemic was collected a long time ago. The samples are all small. As an epidemiologist, you know, if one in 10 have a mental health condition, your sample is 38, you have, you know, one child makes a huge difference and can really skew your results. So that's another caveat. Only six were recruited from the community. The others were either clinic based or focused on a particular problem or recruited by adverts. But there was pre and post data on the same sample using established measures and some interesting findings despite these caveats. So depression symptoms increased significantly. Again, no, in, no increase in anxiety. The, the children who were under 13 were notably less anxious than the older teenagers, but there was no age impact on the level of depression. And the suggestion that this actually is a paper worth paying attention to is really rammed home by the fact that the children under the, the strictest lockdowns were doing worse. So now back to the national survey, we managed to go back to the national survey in July of last year. And in fact, we just collected a second swathe of data. We went back to everyone who'd agreed that we could go back to them. We did an online questionnaire to um, parents um, and to young people, our response rate once we'd excluded people um, because either it was incomplete or um, the funding only covers England. So there were some who'd moved into Wales and Scotland and we weren't allowed to count them. Um, dropped down to 45%, which isn't brilliant, but there'd been no keeping in touch, um, sadly. So it could have been a lot worse. And at least we know a huge amount about the children who we didn't manage to get and were able to wait back to the population. So this is part of a programme of work that's jointly funded by the government and also um, the UKRI. So as I've said, we've done these two waves of data collection for the government that will generate official statistics. And then we are 
using policy um, relevant um, issues to select a small sample to get more in-depth data. So for last year's um, group, it's going to be around service access um, because of the dramatic drop in referrals to child and adolescent mental health services during the first lockdown, which was, was um, coincided with a, a drop in presentations um, to primary care with self-harm in 10 to 7 year old, 17 year olds. And then when schools opened again, and these children were back in front of um, you know, adults who might refer them, children sadly don't often get to bring themselves to services, um, they've flicked back up and actually exceeded pre-pandemic levels. We're also investigating this issue of the fact that um, lockdown experience has varied tremendously. By the time we were collecting data in March, there are real concerns about how children with special educational needs have been catered for. So we are sampling um, on responses to questions around SEND and also eating disorders. So there were screening questions that were asked in 2017 that went into the questionnaires. And actually for those that screen positive, we're going to complete the, the rest of the Dorber eating disorders module to, to just check on the population level um, of the prevalence. And then the final bit of work to come is um, that we will be shortly getting those who agreed to, to sign up to an app in which they can monitor their mood for a four week period during this term. And we will do that in the summer term. And we will also be able to do a third questionnaire survey pushed out via the app. Now, we obviously weren't able to do the same intensive diagnostic measure that we could do last time because it takes a huge amount of time, but we used the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. Now, there is an algorithm that can combine informants. It works best if you have a parent, teacher, and young person in terms of the accuracy with which it predicts those who have an impairing mental health condition. It, it, interestingly, it doesn't make much difference whether you have a parent or a teacher if you only have one adult. And the least accurate is for children um, aged 11 to 16, which is why we recommended using the algorithm because that allowed us to have a parental report which it lifts the accuracy. So this algorithm, which you can download and use on your own data sets um, from that website, splits the sample into three groups. Those who probably have a mental health condition. Now, broadly speaking, they are scoring right at the top end of um, the SDQ score. So 95% of a population sample would score less and they have some impact resulting from their difficulties. Whereas at the other extreme, those who are unlikely have virtually no difficulties and they don't have any impact at all. And obviously the possible group are the children who fall between that. The bottom line, since 2017, we have gone from one in nine children having probable mental health conditions to one in six. And that's quite a load for teachers, if you think about it, that that's gone from kind of three in a class of 30 to five in a class of 30, bearing in mind that there'll also be many others who are not quite at that level. Young women, again, are doing particularly badly. So it's more than one in four young women appear to have a probable mental health um, condition compared to one in four young men. And there are strong associations between child and parental um, mental health in both 2017 in um, dark blue and 2020 in light blue. Um, the increase, the very slight increase amongst the um, families with children with no probable um, disorder is non-significant. Now this, I'm not saying this is causal, correlation does not mean causation, these were both measured at the same time, and actually parenting a child who's really struggling is a big load on parents, and with other work, which I can't mention, I don't have time to go into today, we've shown that um, 
there is a bi-directional association between parental and child mental health, which won't surprise anybody who works in services with children. Similarly, family functioning was poorer in those with a probable disorder. And there's almost a, a dose response that you can see in those graphs between um, those um, with no um, problems and those with problems. Um, again, this is cross-sectional. And as I say, the effect can work in both directions. Thinking about older young people, this um, survey was, um, this study was led from colleagues in Manchester, involves Anne John from Wales. Um, this studied a sample that has been collected over um, several years. And as they get older, they recruit more people at the bottom end. So the, the youngest people are 16, but obviously there's not repeat data on the 16 year olds. Um, and so they analyzed as much data as they had available. And what this demonstrated was um, that young people were doing worse. So the, the 18 to 24 year olds were struggling, particularly young women again, but also of relevance to children. Parents of young children were another vulnerable group whose mental health deteriorated abruptly. Um, this analysis was carried out on data collected in May last year. The same group have literally earlier this week published a trajectory on the same sur survey um, that went and gathered data several times last year about how people were doing. Now a high score is bad. So what you can see is there are two groups of people who have consistently good mental health. They are more likely to be living in an affluent area, to be white, to be male, to be living with a partner um, and not to have a mental health condition. Whereas you have two groups where their mental health deteriorates either abruptly and it's sustained or a gentle um, deterioration over time. And both of those groups are likely to be younger, to be women, to be from an ethnic minority living in a deprived area and not to have a partner. So this pandemic has not affected us equally and social inequalities are really important. As well as deteriorating mental health, um, we, we have how people are viewing what's gone on and you will see there's a strong association with having a mental health condition and feeling that lockdown had made your life worse. But just to emphasize, a quarter of young people have felt their life had been better. And I really look forward to finding out more about why that might be in the interviews we're going to do. And then there are risk factors that are also more prevalent at the moment. So over a quarter reported sleep problems in the last few days. Um, Again, more likely if you have a disorder, that's no surprise. If you're anxious or depressed, um, it can impact the quality of your sleep. But it also, if your sleep is poor, it's not great for your mental state. So we should worry about that. Likewise, loneliness is, is fairly toxic for mental health and strongly associated cross-sectionally in the sample with having a probable disorder, but also worryingly pre prevalent. So one in 10 feeling often or always lonely. I've talked a little bit about serv services. So there was a drop in referrals, but actually in this sample last summer, although about a quarter of those with a probable mental health condition had gone and got help as they normally would, there was a chunk of people, almost half, said that they had delayed or not sought help for a mental health condition, either with or without a physical health condition. Um, which is interesting and worrying. And then in terms of stacking of risk factors, the educational access has always also been very unequal. So this was from the July National Survey with all the list on the left-hand side of things that you would need in order to be able to access remote schooling. And what you will see is consistently lower amongst those who have a probable condition, except 
the, the approaching one in 20 who had virtually no chance of being able to access education um, remotely. And that is going to have aggravated existing worrying um, socioeconomic um, differences between the more affluent and the least affluent in terms of educational attainment. So who should we would be worried about? Well, I hope I've rammed home the um, social inequalities and the fact we should be very worried about further families struggling with finance, struggling with um, food, even um, we shouldn't have them in a society as rich as ours. We also need to worry um, about those who had poor mental health conditions. Now, some, and I, anecdotally, I've heard lots of stories about children, say, with social anxiety, often with or without um, some neurodiverse um, characteristics who actually have had the best access to education that they've had for years during lockdown. They may well be struggling more now, but also anxiety and depression look like it's increased further and that can complicate attendance at school and children and families struggling with this need support and not fines. We shouldn't forget the traumatic or adverse experiences that may have occurred to children during lockdown some of which are listed there. And for children with special educational needs, particularly those with autism spectrum type conditions who struggle with change, they will have experienced a lot of disruption, but also when they're going back to school, it's not going to be school as it was beforehand. And some of them will find that very difficult. So this interesting work from Helen Minnis at Glasgow um, has generated a way of trying to mitigate the impact on vulnerable families, because what their early work last summer showed was that where families had adequate resources, um, they settled into a routine. And if anything, they were in a virtuous cycle of being able to value some aspects of lockdown, like increased family time. Whereas those where there were not adequate resources, there was debt, there was poor mental health, substance misuse, or domestic violence or tension were in a vicious cycle of, of tension breeding more difficulties, breeding more tension. And what they suggest is that really, whilst um, infection levels are low, that schools should be open. They should be the last thing to, to close and the first thing to reopen. But if the infection levels are such that you can't have schools fully open, well, then can you at least have some time at school? And I know, you know, across the nation, the idea was that vulnerable children would come to school. But in fact, the take up for vulnerable children and key workers was very, very low. Um, so that approach didn't work. So maybe it's less stigmatizing and easier just to say, well, everybody comes in for some of the time. We had Nightingale hospitals. Why didn't we have Nightingale schools, for example? And then if that is too much of an infection risk, can you set up closed child care clusters, either with a grandparent or a trusted adult, that just means that the social isolation for days and days and days with a family that's struggling doesn't happen because of the other risks of it doing so? The other place where we have a, a lot of opportunity to intervene, but I think, uh, you know, schools are seen as an ideal setting for so much and have so much to do. I think they're also feeling very pressured is our schools. Um, so the link on this slide relates to a practitioner um, report that I and colleagues from Exeter and elsewhere developed with the Education Endowment Foundation that is based on three systematic reviews of the evidence about optimizing children's behavior. And that relates very strongly to their mental health. So, you know, we all want to be in this top right quadrant with our optimal behavioral repertoire and positive influences feeding off each other, but we all know that if things get stressful, that you know we might get crabby, we might get stroppy, we might not behave as you know to the standard that we wish all the time, and that will be going on in spades at the moment as children cope with peer groups that might have shifted, 
um, getting back into a new routine, perhaps with parents who are tired and frazzled and teachers who are stressed and worried. So the important thing is that schools focus most on what they can directly manage because that's where they are going to impact the mental health of, of children and young people. Schools don't, um, what school you go to doesn't explain a huge amount of the variance in mental health scores in schools. It's, it's depending on what measure you use, it's between two and 5%. But actually, if you are struggling, that small impact might actually make a big difference. And, you know, paying attention to relationships in schools, particularly bullying, but, you know, also promoting positive conflict resolution and positive friendships and an environment where people look out for each other is really important. The teaching and learning environment or school culture or school climate was um, in a study we recently published on 26,000 children from around the UK, was the tractable bit of the school variance. Um, and then attitudes and the concept of the children and the teachers to themselves is something else that schools can mould. So just to sum up, most children, I know it's one in six, are struggling in this clinical population, but actually um, there will always be a clinical population. It's higher than we would like at the moment, as is probably this vulnerable population, but the majority of children will cope. We can be assured in that. But actually what we do next can reduce the number who are vulnerable and reduce the number who are struggling. Mental health is really important and the onset of, of mental disorder that affects adults in a recent um, update of the Dunedin study who are now in middle age is that most people in that cohort had experienced at least one disorder by middle age and there's similar data coming out of Danish um, and other Scandinavian registries. So this is not just something that relates to Dunedin. The onset of a mental health condition occurred by adolescents for most. So child mental health is something we should be really investing in. Mental disorders cost a huge amount. Um, so we should be really worried by this deterioration we are picking up. And some of you may have seen um, this paper which um, relates to some goals for mental health research that were published um, in October of last year. So this um, was negotiated between the funders um, commissioned by the Department of Health and coordinated by Chris Whitty. Goal number one is to halve the number of children experiencing persistent mental health problems. And given what's happened with COVID, we have our work cut out for us even more. I'll stop there and, and stop sharing and take questions. Um. Hey. Uh, well, well, first, I'd just like to thank you for a really, really, really interesting and uh, topical uh, lecture. It's, it's, it certainly made me think. <laughs> and, and actually, I think there are a few questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal the, uh, the opportunity to ask, ask mine first. Um, and so you just made me think towards the end about you know, the benefit of school for children and, uh, and mental health. Do you know if it worked backwards? So is it actually beneficial for parents who are also struggling? Or is it too... And what, children being back at school? Yes. So I, I, I think, yeah. I'm not aware of a database thing, but I just think you cannot do two jobs. Most people desperately care about their children doing well at, at school and their children being all right. And parents beat themselves up so much about how much screen time their kids are having. Mm -hmm. How can you possibly work from home and support small children access schooling? I mean, it's just an impossible ask. And I think people will vary in how flexible and understanding their, um, their employers are. I think Catherine Abel, who studies women's mental health, says the number of women who've been made redundant which may well relate to this issue is huge. So yeah, I, I think it certainly does. Um, I think we probably all have a newfound respect for teachers yes. <laughs> and just what they offer too. Well, to us all, yeah, not just to children. That's the point, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, okay, there is a question in, this, in, in the Q&A, but that also maybe there's a question from the panel as well. 
So, so the question from the Q&A is, um, in the case where one in six children have probable difficulties, okay, to what, to, so to what extent is that um, in children who are already diagnosed, I guess, and already vulnerable, and to what extent was that new? That is such a good question. And when I prize the data out of ONS, and I can look at that, we will tell you. So at the moment, all we've been able to do is repeated cross-sectional analysis. So we can say it's one in nine, and then it was one in six. So I can't tell you the answer to that. I would have thought that, you know, my gut feeling is we'll find considerable persistence but the fact the numbers got up, there will be some who were previously in that vulnerable area yeah. who, um, you know, just eyeballing the statistics is the group that were possible last time is smaller. Yeah. And, he, and he was structured in before you had that 50 50 split, didn't you? So I guess 50%. Yeah. It's, it's either grown or they've sort of recovered. But yeah, okay, so there's a turnover. Okay. Yes, Heather. And you can ask questions, great. Hi, Tassi. I was uh, struck by your very strong sort of recommendations about, you know, let the schools stay open as long as possible and get them back open as early as possible. And I think this has been a very big debate in the nation as to whether that's the right thing to do or not, etc. I mean, it's clear from this perspective that of young people's mental health that we should be doing that. I, I, I'm with you on that. But I didn't know whether you had... Uh, it wouldn't really have been the focus of your study, but it's the kind of next thing going out, which is, is, uh, is there data, do you, do, do you understand the sort of knock-ons into sort of vertical families where, you, yes, you've got the children in school and, yes, the parents are healthy, but actually they're very closely linked to the grandparents and they, therefore the transmission up through the family that way. I mean, my other half is now, unfortunately, put the kettle on, so I'm getting back, a lot of background noise now. Is always sort of saying all sort of all the grandparents and everybody else should just sort of all, everyone over sixty or over fifty, depending on how charitable he was being, should have all stayed at home and hidden, and everybody else should have got on with life. That was roughly his 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 thinking. It's quite radical. Anyway, I think people have studied this, so this is not my own data, and I apologise if I remember it incorrectly. Children are less likely to transmit and it's clearer for primary school children than it is for teenagers. And I think, you know, there is a judgment call about when you close the schools. If there is a lot of COVID in the community, bringing people into school and of course the parents will mingle um, as they drop kids off or, you know, the, the teachers can work hard to keep children um, socially distanced within school, but actually the teenagers are going to and from on, on their own, etc. So I think if there is a lot of infection in the community, then schools do have to close. But actually teachers don't seem to be at increased risk when um, people have analysed data, which suggests that children aren't transmitting a lot. And I think, you know, it is a judgment call at what point you say, right, there's been an infection, we need to close that bubble or we need to close that school. But I think the general rule should be that we try and keep schools, particularly primary schools, open as much as possible. OK, I'm conscious that we've got to 4.30. Yeah, <laughs> really I'm really to... sorry. Yes, don't worry, it's not a problem. It's, all, it's a problem at all, so don't worry. Um, I think just on behalf of everybody, we should thank you again for... A great public lecture, thank you. It's, I've definitely learned something, and that's good, because it takes <laughs> and hopefully everybody else has as well. And, and so hopefully we can keep interacting between Cardiff and, and South Oh, Wales. absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. Cambridge, or, and Exeter. <laughs> yeah, and Exeter. <laughs> and so, Brilliant, well, thank you for inviting me, and um, I hope to see many of you another time, and, you know, I'm glad you've had a good day, but I must scarper now, so no bye. Thank you, very much. Much. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Does it, do we want to have a, just extend the discussion a bit a lot further or are we happy to wrap up? I think it's probably a natural point to bring things Seems to like a natural yeah. point. And we, and we haven't got a huge number of questions and actually there were quite a lot of answers provided. <laughs> so, so I think uh, it's been a really, really, really fascinating session, afternoon and both sessions. Uh, I've learned a lot, as I say, which is great, and uh, and hopefully everybody else has. And I haven't quite grasped the interaction between 
parents and children until until actually now and it's incredible isn't it it's really interesting to work on that and how it works okay so on behalf of everybody everybody uh well the the waterloo foundation i guess the chapter which i've called future minds uh i'd like to thank you for attending uh once again, thank Heather for actually probably making all of this done, including the Samaritans, actually. So that's, thank you very much. <laughs> and um, we will be doing this again, maybe sometime in real life. <laughs> but you're still entitled, you're still welcome to join by uh, Zoom even, even then. <laughs> thank you, Adrian. And also thank you, Jeremy, for, for hosting the day and, and, and for moving it forward so smoothly. It was very, very good. And thank you also to Julie and Catherine for all the behind the scenes support and, and the rest of the team too. Thank you. Thank you all very much as well. And I guess a final thank you to all the speakers. So really very interesting day. Thank you. Yeah, it's been fascinating. And I think the fact that we had so many people attending shows how much interest there was in it. So yeah, great. See you all soon, I hope. Yeah. <laughs>